Uh, you should see a phone number at the bottom of your TV screen. Please call in with your question, and students will sort through the questions for the best ones to ask the candidates. Candidates, uh, there will be up to three minutes for opening statements, up to two minutes for responses to questions, and as much as three minutes for closing statements. Our timekeeper in the front row will let you know when the time is up. You will now have opening statements beginning with Mr. Gross, and Ms. Mizell Hubs, and then Mr. Moore. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Gross, and I'm running for the school board because I'm not satisfied. Now, before I start talking about why I'm not satisfied, let me tell you a few things about myself. Uh, I grew up in Portland, graduated from Chevers High School, and went off to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and earned a degree in engineering science. Now, I come to Cape Elizabeth, and I look at the school system from a couple of different viewpoints. The first viewpoint is the viewpoint of a parent. Uh, my wife and I moved to Cape Elizabeth in 1980. We raised our two children here. Uh, both of our children went through the entire K through 12 school system here, uh, one of them graduating in 1999 and a second graduating in 2002. So I'm familiar with the Cape school system from the point of view of a parent. I've gone through all of the, the parent crises, everything from, uh, from uh, trying to determine which second grade teacher our child should get to, which colleges they should apply to. But I also have a second viewpoint. Uh, four years ago, I retired. And when I retired, I began to volunteer here in Cape High School in Dr. Efren's freshman honors physics class. Uh, I spent about two or three days a week coming to his class, listening to his lectures. I actually did the homework problems, uh, took the tests, uh, I actually helped out in the class when the uh, students are working in groups. Sometimes Dr. Efron would assign students to me who were getting a little bit behind because perhaps they had a, a concussion and hadn't been able to take tests or were having some difficulty with the mathematics. So I got a very different viewpoint and a very unique viewpoint from volunteering in the school system. I essentially was almost um, attending high school again on a part-time basis as a, as a senior citizen. I saw the same physics class taught year after year after year. I could see the changes that Dr. Efren would put into it. And, and I saw from that viewpoint that the, the students also would come in. Every year would be a fresh group of students, and they'd all have very similar uh, uh, questions. They would make very similar mistakes year after year. Now, from these two viewpoints, I had three questions that dissatisfied me. Uh, number one. Uh, I looked at the outstanding school system we have here, but I noticed that we're using uh, teaching methods that are about 100 years old for the most part, and, and I'm not satisfied with this. I looked at our school budget. I saw that we're going to have a windfall of $700,000 in 2016 when we pay back one of our bonds and our, and our interest expense goes down by that much. I see the plan that the existing school board has to utilize those funds, and I'm not satisfied with that plan. I think we can come up with a better plan. And I also look and see that our teacher contract will expire in 2014. And I'm not satisfied with the teacher contract the way it is now. I think we can get a better contract and uh, better for our teachers and better for our school. Thank you. I would like to begin by saying thank you to Ted Jordan and to Jack and to your entire AP uh, cl government class and the students here representing the class for arranging this forum that provides candidates like myself um, with an opportunity to introduce um, myself to the community via um, public you know, attendance or online or um, on the video. Um, I would also like to note my gratitude towards the current school board administration and teachers for all the time and energy they have obviously put forth in their pursuit of building a school system that holds the best interest of all residents at heart. My name is Susanna Mazel hubs and I am running for the seat on the school board which will be vacated upon the departure of current school board member Mary Townsend, whose term ends this December. Therefore, lastly, I would like to directly express to Mary, who is not here, my appreciation for her outstanding tenure and genuine dedication to this board and, these, and this community over her six years, I believe, that she's been here. 
I am a mother of three children in Cape Elizabeth school system, Aiden, Jude, and Freya Hubs. Aiden is in seventh grade, Jude is in sixth, and Freya is just beginning at Pong Cove as a first grader. I am married to Robert Hubs, who is an anesthesiologist with Spectrum Medical Group. Before living in Maine, between us, my husband and I have lived in a variety of different places that have also been beautiful and unique. However, no other place has ever instilled within me such a level of joy, appreciation, and good fortune as Cape Elizabeth has. Since moving here eight years ago, my awe and love of Cape Elizabeth's natural beauty, as well as my respect and gratitude for its residents, has only grown larger than I even knew was possible. I believe that a strong public education system benefits everyone. Strong schools yield strong students, prepared and poised to succeed in a global economy. Strong students yield families attracted by the promise of providing their children with the best skills and resources to succeed in life. A town whose desirability is warranted by its historical record and support of education yields social and financial resources. These resources yield a stable and vibrant local economy and property values that rise rather than fall. With this perspective, I believe that we are all stakeholders in our public education system and therefore all responsible and accountable. Our teachers, administration, and school board realize this, and I'm very excited and encouraged with the direction our school system is headed. The missions and values brought forth through their guidance and experience, thanks to Meredith Nadeau and the school board, proves that our town values on growing students that are healthy of mind, body, and spirit. Furthermore, the 10-year capital investment plan put forth demonstrates that as a group, the school board and superintendent places equal value on the financial health and well-being of each community member, from the youngest to the oldest residents. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, good evening. I am Michael Moore, and I am running for the school board. I believe there are tremendous opportunities for our schools and community services programs to continue to positively impact all of our citizens. I am running for the school board to make sure these opportunities are realized. Three years ago, I ran for the school board targeting specific opportunities to move the district forward. The first was to attract and promote strong, innovative leadership across the district. Over the past three years, the school board has hired a new school superintendent, new elementary and middle school principals and assistant principals, a new director of instruction, and made other leadership position changes. The school board also worked with school and community services leaders to promote a culture of change and innovation. But attracting strong, innovative leaders is not enough. Successful schools know where they are headed and have collectively held missions and values. Last year, the district unveiled a new mission and vision statement reflecting broad stakeholder input and a clear consensus, consensus on where we want to go. This past year, the process for a new strategic plan for the schools began and the final strategic plan is scheduled for completion next year. Knowing where the district headed is critical but not enough. Successful schools align resources with goals and demonstrate effective and creative resource stewardship. During the past three years, I helped spearhead the development of a three-year school budget, a 10-year capital stewardship plan for the schools and community services programs, helped navigate the district through a state funding curtailment, and assisted in the development of the school's new mission and vision statement and the new five-year strategic plan for the schools. I firmly believe community-supported goals, thoughtful planning, and clear learning benchmarks will promote transparency, ensure resources are aligned with priorities, and position our schools, and most importantly, our students to flourish. Over the next three years, our schools will continue the challenging but exciting work of living the new mission and vision statement and implementing the new strategic plan. The opportunities are enormous, but we also must realize that many significant changes may be made. I have nearly 20 years of professional experience as an investment analyst and business strategist helping organizations and individuals navigate change. I have proven school board leadership, an open mind, a willingness to listen, entrepreneurial perspective, and high energy to give to the board. I will not shy away from difficult decisions or questions. I will constantly ask, what is the issue? What is the opportunity? What is the best solution for Cape Elizabeth? I am excited about where our schools and community services programs are headed, and I would be honored to earn your vote for the school board. Thank you. Thank you, candidates.
Uh, with that, we will move on to the open response questions. Uh, each candidate will have up to two minutes to respond to each question. And we will begin with Ms. Mizell Hubs. Uh, question one, do you favor moving to a standard-based grades and proficiency-based diploma? I do. Uh, first of all, I, I do believe that all the work the school board and administration has put into um, determining what, what will best support their mission and values. Um, they've, they've done their, their legwork and I, I support their, their movement towards it. Um, I also uh, believe that standard-based assessments are um, very worthwhile to move towards because they target um, a larger range of individuals. There's, there's teaching to um, the individual, their different needs, uh, there, it's, it's supporting the teachers so that they become informed and professionally experienced outside the classroom with uh, learning how best to engage and teach students um, K through 12. So yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Moore, you'll have two minutes. Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> there, currently, the district already uses standard-based grades. In Ponco, for example, uh, uh, there's standards based on reading proficiency, critical thinking skills. Um, so that's one observation. Uh, the question, I think, is, uh, you know, as a, in, high, in the high school, uh, do I support the standard-based grades or proficiency uh, diploma? And the answer is I, I support it uh, because it's a reality. It's being mandated by the state for implementation. Uh, I think the critical part of this is to, uh, there will be a tremendous amount of education required for parents. As you can imagine, if your child uh, graduated four years ago and had a certain grading system in colleges and you believe that's what they're looking for, there will be a lot of uh, work done by the district on helping parents understand, one, that districts are already currently using this model and colleges are moving toward it. So I do support it. I think it, uh, we need to do a lot of work on education uh, for the parents. Um, it's part of the strategic plan. Um, I think uh, we're going to look at the district, I hope, looks at what we currently already do well in this area and builds uh, on those strengths. And like I said, the biggest challenge and opportunity will be ensuring that parents understand how this will impact their child's uh, life and, and particularly how it may impact um, you know, college opportunities. Thank you. Uh, now Mr. Gross. Uh, could you repeat the question please? Yes. Uh, do you favor moving towards a standard base grades and proficiency based diploma? Uh, yes I do. In, in general I certainly do. Uh, Let's actually talk about a single instance. Uh, for example, in the Common Core standards, which would be the standards we would be uh, judging our students by, uh, the eighth grade mathematics standards calls for every eighth grade student to be able to be proficient in this skill. Solve the systems of two linear equations and two variables algebraically and estimate solutions by graphing the equations. Now, I think that every single high school student should be able to be proficient in that standard before they can graduate. But there are going to be dozens and dozens and dozens of standards in, in uh, just in math and, and, and also an in in equal number of standards in, in verbal. So I wonder if what standards-based uh, assessment and standard-based goals means is every student has to master every standard. Now, I'm sure that all of the students we have here in the room today could solve uh, two simultaneous equations. And those are the types of equations where, for example, you say 7x plus 2y equals 24, 2y divided by x equals 5. Now, there are two equations. Neither one of those equations can be solved by itself. And so students have to learn that you solve one equation for one variable and then take that and plug it into the second equation. I think every student should have this skill, but I wonder if we have a total of 100 mathematical skills, are we really saying that no student will graduate unless they are proficient in every single one of those 100 skills? So I'd like, to, I'd like someone to answer that question before I, uh, I voted absolutely I'm in favor of these. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll now move on to question two, uh, beginning with Mr. Moore, followed by Mr. Gross. 
Uh, question two, if some programs in the school had to be cut, aside from the core academics, which would you favor cutting and which would you save? Um, I think as uh, program decisions are made uh, through the budget process, so uh, we would, I would look at all uh, the resources we had available, looked at, uh, look at demand for those programs. Um, I am not going to answer what programs I would cut. I think you need to understand uh, what the purpose of those programs are. Are they consistent with the strategic plan? Are they consistent with community expectations of a high quality education? Are they consistent with expectations that the budget reflects the current uh, financial climate? Um, I would hope, and we've made good progress on that, of creatively using our current resources. Um, I do think uh, there are programs that are discontinued primarily because there's not demand for that. In the high school, the programs are adjusted based on enrollment trends, so um, I currently don't have any programs that I, I'm looking to cut at, at Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Gross. Uh, I don't favor cutting programs, and uh, let me explain what I mean by this. If we get, have to cut our budget, that means we're going to have to cut a certain dollar amount. So let's say we have to cut $200,000. Now, that doesn't mean we have to cut programs. If we look at the budget, what we have is a, a $22 million budget, and $17 million of that are the salaries and benefits to the school employees. Now, if you look at the breakdown of the school employees, we have 261 employees. But of those 261, only 121 are actually regular teachers. Those are the teachers who are teaching the very programs the question is asking about. So what I think is that we, sh we shouldn't look to cut programs if we have to cut 200 or $300,000 from the budget. What I would look at is say, all right, we're going to cut in that $17 million of salary and benefits. But the place to cut isn't in programs. The, the, the people we should keep are the 120 room, uh, 121 schoolroom teachers. And if we keep the teachers, we'd by definition keep the programs. But we have another 130 or 40 employees who are not regular school team, school, uh, uh, are not regular school teachers. And that's where I would look to cut. They would be, there's about $10 million in the salaries of the, of the, uh, of the school teacher, of, of the, the regular teachers, and the seven million in salaries for all the other employees. So rather than cut programs, uh, what I would cut is the, look to cut would be the employees who are not regular teachers. As an example of why I'm against cutting programs, when my son went to Cape Elizabeth School, he took a class here at Cape called C++ Programming, a computer programming course. He went on to become a software engineer, and he has his own business right now. The, his success and decision, actually, to go into software engineering, in large part, was because when he was in this high school, he took C++ programming. This year, there was not a single computer programming course in the high school. There was one last year, but it was cut this year. So that's why I don't think it's a good idea to cut programs. I do think when you have to cut dollars, you look at the employees who are not teachers or not regular teachers, and that's the first place you look to make cuts. Thank you. Now, Ms. Michelle Hubs. Um, well, I, I, I would try, first of all, my hardest not to cut programs at all. Um, I, I, I do believe that th there's not a lot of wiggle room in the budget. And uh, therefore, every annual you know, budget decision is approached with, with um, experience and knowledge of, of what, if anything, can go, or if anything is is superfluous, um, and I I feel that there is there are solutions that are creative um, that it can avoid budget cuts. Um, that said, I'm in no position if at this point, um, never having been on the school board, but in no position to ever be able to identify if if, I, if you know if I had to um, something to cut. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to question three. What is your view on a revision of the substance abuse policy? Do you think it needs to be changed at all? Uh, uh, starting with Mr. Gross. Uh, I looked at the uh, substance abuse policy. We uh, was just put on the uh, school website a, a week or so ago. 
And it was the first time I actually had looked at it, and I was amazed at how stringent the policy is. It seems almost draconian. But then I thought about it, and it seemed to me that we really aren't following the policy. It sounds like when you read the policy that if any one of the students in any of our school systems uh, recognizes or realizes or knows that another student is utilizing uh, drugs or some, some other sort of substance, it seems like from the policy they're supposed to come forward and let the school know about that, let the administration know about that. Now, this, I think this is a great, this is like the honor code at, at uh, West Point or Annapolis, and, and I think it's a very admirable policy, but I don't think it's happening. I, it's hard for me to believe that this, from based on when my children were in high school and based on uh, the, the kids today, I don't think the kids are following those policies. So if they were, then when you look at the days of suspension and, 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 uh, and the different penalties you have, they, the penalties are very severe and, and it seems like it would be a very effective policy. I just don't think we're, I think we have a great policy, but I don't really believe that we're following it. And when I say we're following it, the, the people who aren't following is I don't believe the students in the uh, school system are actually following our policy. Thank you. So you do think it needs to be changed? I, I, would, I would like the policy to be followed. And if it were followed, I would worry it might be too draconian. The penalties might be too stiff. But because, the, the, for the most part, it isn't being followed by the students, I don't think the, the penalties are too draconian because they're, they're never being imposed upon the students. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mizell Hubs? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I love that the, the policy is routinely reviewed and updated. I think that is a really important part of um, serving generation after generation and within each generation updating. Um, what, what I feel could be improved upon in the policy is, some, is, is finding ways somehow where the ownership of these beliefs and values in, in protecting our children from substance abuse, the ownership should also fall on the community and the parents. Um, I think, I think to some degree, uh, not you know, n not everybody uh, is aware of how much um, is is going on out there. In part because, you know, we don't want to get anybody into trouble. But I, I think it, it in this case it takes a a village effort to to uh, unite and um, if, if we're serious about handling this problem and handling. Um, substance abuse in general and protecting our students and protecting our community, I, I believe that it's, it's a community slash family slash student um, goal and it, the policy sh really should encompass all, all parts. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, if you look at the investment, uh, I'm sorry, the substance abuse policy, it's one component of the district strategy to uh, first, be open about that we do have substance abuse issues uh, in the schools. Um, I think the policy in itself, like m many policies do, primarily focuses on the consequences. And I think the challenge is if we're discussing what the consequences are, we, we've failed um, already because the, a poor decision's already been made. Um, so when I look at the policy, I'll say, what would the rationale be for a change? What results are we expecting? How are we going to measure if those results were achieved? And importantly, uh, the reason the policy is up for review as well is to invite all stakeholders for their input. So when, if you're uh, in the schools, the question is if the policies haven't been implemented, that a poor decision's already been made. I hope uh, and would, uh, the students feel empowered um, to make better decisions and also we need to encourage a culture within the schools where there's positive peer pressure not to make a decision that even though you have many years left in front of you, um, you know, a DUI, a possession charge will be with you for, for your, the rest of your life. So I look forward to get, hearing stakeholders' input on this issue. But in the long term, I think the solution will be uh, largely on encouraging students to, to make better decisions and understanding the consequences um, of making a poor decision related to substance abuse. Thank you. Um, question four. 
In light of recent cyberbullying around the nation and video game playing in class, would you be willing to cut or restrict the iPad program for middle schoolers? Uh, starting with Ms. Mizell Hobbs. Uh, I don't see that solving the problem. Um, and I also don't see iPads or technology going away. Um, I think to, to remove it um, is, is, tr is trying to make a difference in, in something that, of course, needs to improve with cyberbullying and, um, and things of that nature. But no, I, I, I don't believe that removing iPads or laptops um, would, would be beneficial um, or solve the problem. Uh, of cyberbullying. Uh, I also would um, think that by the students being forced to handle and recognize that there is this presence of, of um, you know, this negative side to cyber, or not cyberbullying, but this negative side um, out there on the internet, um, that they learn to make their own um, limits and learn to self-direct uh, to make responsible choices. Um, I, I think taking away the iPads robs them of that opportunity to grow and learn and teach themselves um, what's OK and what's not. Uh, now, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, I, I do not favor uh, restricting uh, iPads or technology. Um, I don't think it will solve the issue of, of bullying. I think cyberbullying is one type of bullying, and if bullying is the issue, uh, if you think you're just going to eliminate bullying because you remove technology, I think uh, th that would be a misguided strategy. Um, I think regarding technology that there should be a balance between the utility of using technology to enhance learning, but also balance this with a parent's desire to have control um, over, over what their child sees on, on the computer. So I think there's some thinking we need to do regarding technology and balancing parental um, ability to impact or control what their child sees and what the potential benefits are from having technology. And I think bullying, um, unfortunately, is an issue that's been around uh, f for forever. Um, I do think it's positive that it's being talked about openly, and I, again, would challenge students um, you know, to look at the decisions they're making, how it may impact them, how it may reflect on, on our school, and a big part of the mission and vision statement um, and strategic plan will be to explicitly teach values such as compassion, uh, self-respect. So um, there's no quick result, or there's no quick fix to this, um, but it is something um, that the district's uh, addressing. And again, I ask the students to, to be leaders and, um, you know, help us uh, reduce the bullying in the schools. Mr. Gross? Uh, I think that, that we should not eliminate the iPads. If you want to eliminate a problem, you should go to eliminate the source of the problem, not the tools that the source of the problems are using. The iPads are merely a tool. The source, obviously, are the students. Now, up until, I, have, I must confess, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't think bullying was that big a deal. All right, kids are making fun of one another in school, so what? But a couple of years ago, I went out to Westbrook High School, or actually it was in the middle school, but the high school was putting it on. And, and you may recall a couple of years ago, there was a high school student in Westbrook, and she had been, been bullied so bad, and a talk show host uh, found out about it, and, and he interviewed her. This girl really had an enormous amount of courage. She came in and he interviewed her on the radio and she described the bullying. She was, that her, these are her friends were putting her through in Westbrook High School. And so as a result of the, the, t the talk show on radio, they held a seminar or a meeting, a public meeting in the, for the, the high school students in Westbrook and their parents in the middle school out in Westbrook. I attended that from Cape. I read about it in the paper and went there. And I was completely shocked. Parent after parent got up, and, and they were in tears telling stories about how their children would come home from school, and, and they would just be so upset they didn't want to go back to school. One father talked about his daughter had been threatening to commit suicide because of the bullying she was receiving in the high school. And, and ever since then, I've, I've said, this is a serious problem. And, and the way I look at the problem, getting rid of the iPads has nothing to do with the problem. The only way that this problem is going to be solved is when the majority of the students in the school, every time they see 
bullying taking place, either physical, <coughs> either physical bullying or cyber bullying, they stand up and shame the student who is actually doing the bullying. And that's the only way I think this will be solved. And until that, that the, the student, the majority of the students in the school act that way, instantaneously stand together and, and essentially say, shame on you to anyone who bullies it, then the problem will, will still be with us. Thank you. Uh, now before I ask the next question, I'd like to announce that the students will go around and collect any questions that the audience has written down on a note card. It appears that we have none, so I will <laughs> ask the next question. Um, with regards to the Thomas Memorial Library, are you in favor of renovating the building, uh, renovating the collection more towards technology, neither or both? Oh. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yeah, would you re repeat the question, please? Uh, with regards to Thomas <laughs> Memorial Library, are you in favor of renovating the building, uh, renovating the collection towards more technology, more, neither or both? Um, I'm in favor of uh, looking at both of those issues and um, fortunately the school board doesn't have oversight of Thomas Memorial Library. Um, you know, I think the, the committees identify that there are structural issues uh, that must be addressed. So rather if it's renovation or a new build, I, I would defer to, to their judgment. But I do know that there are uh, very significant needs that need to be addressed and if renovation is um, the best option for that I would support that. Um, I also favor, I'm not sure if, how you characterize it, but um, I do think there's a recognition already by the library that uh, you know different sorts of media are increasing. The library's made great strides in terms of audio as a source of media. I know you can go to the Thomas Memorial site and download digital books as part of the state of Maine. So I think they're making great progress in that manner. And I think they've demonstrated that their willingness to adapt to, to programming and, and user needs. So I am in favor of um, a renovation and I am in favor of um, you know, broadening the, the media that needs to be there. I, I do, I'm, I'm not gonna give you a specific number um, because the, there's a committee involved uh, with that and I wouldn't want to uh, speak ahead of, of the work they're already doing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gross? Um, I believe that most people think of renovating the Memorial, Thomas Memorial Library as, as creating a new and better building to warehouse sh uh, shelf after shelf of books. I think this is a mistake. I think uh, of all the times in history, this is the least the worst time to go out and, and create bricks and mortar building to, put, to store shelves and shelves of books. Now, up until three years ago, I used to take out probably about four or five books each month from our library. But I got a Kindle three years ago, and since I got that Kindle, I have never taken out another book from the Thomas Memorial Library. I think if we're gonna spend millions of dollars to build a new building, and that building these renovations are, are just making space for better bookshelves for, to store the books. It's the wrong way to go completely. Now, if the renovation is talking about using com a completely different design, a design that's centered around e-books, a design that's centered around teleconferencing, a design that's centered around being, letting our, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth utilize the library to do teleconferencing, to do group discussions with social media, with people all over the country, to have speakers from all over the country not come here physically, but come on a giant screen that then the, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth would, able to, would be able to view into the, in, in the library. That type of renovation, the technology renovation, I'm all in favor of. But just building a $5 million or $10 million beautiful building to, and installing brand new bookshelves to, help, to, to house a lot of thousands and thousands of paper books, no, that's the wrong way to go. Ms. Michelle Hubs? Yes. Um, I, I do believe that uh, a, a reasonable, careful uh, plan to renovate the library uh, is 
is warranted and a, a good idea. I don't believe in new uh, construction. I, I don't think that that's uh, necessary. Um, I, I also believe, though, that perhaps the concept of what a library is also has to be renovated um, to reflect mm. changes, as Mr. Gross um, was indicating, um, and the changes in, in how we do access uh, information. So call it a library, call it something else, whatever. But I, I think um, expanding, having the community's understanding of what a library offers it, on an expanded level is important. Um, and I, I do feel that uh, to reflect where we are in, in this day and age that the library needs to uh, advance accordingly um, with technology. Uh, Furthermore, I also believe that if we are able to uh, strengthen the, the resources at the library via technology or otherwise, um, that it will greatly benefit the youngest students. They'll, they'll grow up with, with an established, helpful resource that they will be used to um, moving forward. Thank you. Um. This question will begin with uh, Mr. Gross. It is, how do you plan to manage town council responsibilities with your other commitments? You mean school board, not yes, town council? Yes, yes, yep. sorry. Uh, well, luckily, I retired four years ago, which is when I started volunteering at the high school in Dr. Efren's class. So I don't find it a, I, I, the problem I would have would be managing the amount of time I spend at the high school volunteering and freshman, in both the freshman uh, honors physics class and now uh, more recently, the AP uh, Physics with Calculus class, and balancing that against the school board work. But I would, I would imagine, I enormously enjoy going into the high school, uh, wandering around. When, whenever, if Dr. Efren assigns a student for me, and we're going to meet during the student study period, and that's a period when Dr. Efren's teaching physics, I can't meet with, uh, with a student in in the physics classroom. So I wander down the hallway and look for a math or some other classroom that's open and go in there. And, and by doing this, it's amazing the, the stuff you learn about, um, about other teachers, other subjects there in, in the school is amazing. If I was, when I'm talking about balancing the school board duties versus my retirement duties, which are volunteering uh, in, uh, in the high school to, for, the, uh, for the physics classes, I would like to see my, I would look at the, the opportunity to be on the school board so I could wander over to the middle school. I've always been wondering how they're teaching uh, algebra, for example, in the seventh or the eighth grade in the middle school. I see the, the algebra, the results of the algebra in, uh, in freshman honors physics. The great majority of the students in freshman honors physics took algebra either in the eighth grade or back in the seventh grade. And, and, I'd, and, and yet I see the enormous diversity in the skill level the students have in algebra. Some of them are, are wonderful students, and some of them make the silliest mistakes, the simplest equation. They just hem and haw and scratch their head, and they can't solve the equation. When if anyone who had a year of algebra should solve the equation like that. So I look at balancing the duties on the school board as allowing me to satisfy my curiosity by looking at <clears throat> visiting other classrooms, other schools, other than the, high, the physics, uh, the physics uh, uh, classroom in the high school, and learning a lot more about how our teachers are, what they're, what they're teaching our students and, and the methods they're using, which methods are working and which methods are not working. Thank you. Uh, now, Ms. Michelle Hubbs. Um, well, thank you. That's a very good question to whoever put it out there. It's one that I've uh, had to ask myself uh, prior to deciding whether or not to run. Um, but it, it took basically looking at uh, role models to see how it's done. And I, I think, one, you have to have a dedication and a passion for the cause. And with that, you know, I do believe where there's a will, there's a way. Um, but I, I, m majority of people who volunteer on these um, school boards and town council uh, manage, manage it in addition to full-time jobs, raising families. And uh, I'm inspired if, if by them. Uh, I feel confident in myself that um, I can also balance the three main things in my life, um, my family, school board, 
um, and also my pursuit of art. So I think it's a matter of energy, which I have, um, and, a, and a will to make it work. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Uh, well, I'm, I'm currently on the school board. I think I've been able to manage uh, the school board responsibilities with other commitments. Um, like we all have choices in life and if something that you make a priority you tend to get done and uh, being uh, not only on the school board but being uh, very involved and focused on the school board uh, is a priority. Fortunately I have a wonderful family and a very supportive employer so um, I've been able to manage it and, and expect I'll, I'll be able to continue to manage it if I'm lucky enough to get reelected. Okay, uh, I think that concludes our open response questions. Uh, we will now move to the lightning round. Um, in this round, the candidates answer the questions with a one-word answer, yes or no. So we, we, we will begin. Do you favor putting a cap on the maximum number of AP courses a high school student can take? Mr. Moore? No. Uh, Mr. Gross? No. Ms. Michelle Hubbs? No. Is the increased security in the schools sufficient, Mr. Gross? Um, I think it's, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, Ms. Michelle Hubs? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Is the increased security in the schools necessary, uh, Mr. Gross? No, not at all. Ms. Michelle Hubs? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Do you support parking fees for students at the high school, Ms. Michelle Hubs? Yes. Uh, Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Gross? Yes. Do you support the cuts made to the high school nursing staff, Mr. Moore? Say, say that again. Do you support the cuts made to the high school's nursing staff? Uh, no. Uh, Ms. Michelle Hubs? No, because I, I don't know enough to, to say either way. Uh, Mr. Gross? Yes, I support. And do you believe that the state should be contributing more money to Cape Elizabeth for our schools, Mr. Gross? Uh, no. Ms. Michelle Hubs? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Do you think that the educational benefits of the iPad program at the middle school would outweigh the distractions that would likely accompany them? Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Michelle Hubs? Yes. Mr. Gross? No. What is your stance on the use of pesticides on school fields? Would you try to change this, Mr. Gross? Uh, I don't know, actually. I didn't, I didn't realize we used pesticides. <laughs> Ms. Michelle Hubs? Yes. Mr. Moore? Uh, we repeat a question. What is your stance on the use of pesticides on the school fields? Would you try to change this? Do you want, do you want to know what my stance is or yes or no? Are, are you for or against it? I'm, I'm for or against pesticides? The use of pesticides on the school fields. Uh, yes. Yes, you are for it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I answered it the way you asked it. Yeah. So. Oh, okay, okay. I think we should use students' intention to go out and pull all the weeds up one by one. Then we wouldn't need any pesticides. Okay. That concludes the lightning round. Uh, we will now begin closing statements, starting with Ms. Michelle Hubs, then Mr. Moore, and concluding with Mr. Gross. Okay. Um, thank you again to everyone for your time and your interest. Um, it's a, an exciting time. It's a great time of change and transitions, which I would love to be a part of. Um, I believe that I offer a skill of problem solving and communication and bringing collaboration between people. Um, and I also believe that uh, I would be capable of um, firing up the community's support um, of looking at this as a, a town-wide goal. I believe that we are all stakeholders, uh, whether we have children or not, um, in the school district. And um, I want to continue to work in synchronicity with the current school board and administration because I do believe in their mission and values and uh, I, I want to support it and um, work towards uh, a future that I believe has a lot of potential for our students and also for our town. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moore? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, I believe there are tremendous opportunities for our schools and community services programs to continue to positively impact all of our citizens. Uh, I'm running for the school board to make sure these opportunities are realized. Like I said, over the next three years, our schools will continue the challenging but exciting work of living the new mission and vision statement and implementing the new strategic plan. The opportunities are enormous and exciting. I believe my professional experience, positive energy, and proven school board leadership skills will help the district realize these wonderful opportunities. I will encourage innovative leadership, a priority-driven culture, transparent communications, and financial discipline. I'm excited about where our schools and community services programs are headed, and I would be honored to earn your vote for the school board. Thank you. And Mr. Gross. Um, I'd like to talk about poetry for a little bit. Um, there's a poem that, by T.S. Eliot called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Perhaps a lot of you students have studied it in literature. It's that poem that begins, let us go then you and I when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. <clears throat> now about two-thirds of the way through this poem, Prufrock asks a question. Prufrock says, do I dare, do I dare, do I dare to eat a peach? Now Prufrock isn't talking about whether he should eat a particular piece of fruit or not. Prufrock is looking back at his whole life, and he's seeing his whole life he has been very conventional. He has done what society said you should do. He wore the right clothes that society said you should wear. He, his conversations were all polite conversations about soci what society said you should be. And when he, when he had a teacup, he held it up with his finger in just the right position and society said you should hold your little finger. And now at the end of his life he's saying, well, was that right? Maybe, maybe I should have taken a chance. Maybe once in my life I should have taken everything I had in my whole life, rolled it up in a ball and threw it like a die and, and took a chance and see if what happened. But he hadn't done that. And so right now when you're looking at the candidates for the school board, I think you want to think, ask that question. Does, does that candidate dare to eat a peach? I mean, maybe we shouldn't take any chances. Maybe we, should, we shouldn't make any wild, ch uh, wild changes. We have a terrific school system here. It's, it's always been ranked as one of the top three or four school systems in the entire state. So maybe we shouldn't consider making any drastic changes, any big changes. Maybe we should just play it safe like proof rock and, and keep doing the same things that we've done year after year. We've got terrific results, why not do it? Well, if that's what you want for a school board candidate, perhaps I'm not the right candidate for you. I think you should look at the candidates and ask yourself, is that candidate, does that candidate dare to eat a peach? I dare to eat a peach. I am not satisfied with things they are now, even though we have a terrific school system. And so when you look at the candidates, and, and look at myself in particular, ask every candidate that question. The answer you'll get from me is yes. I am not like J. Alfred Prufrock. I do dare to eat a peach. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the school board por portion of this uh, candidate's night. We'll now move on to the uh, town council version. I'd like to thank all the candidates, as well as everyone who has come out tonight to hear this.
Hello. Good evening. Welcome to the second half of tonight's Candidates Night, in which we address the three people running for two town council seats in Cape Elizabeth. Now on my left, let me introduce the candidates. We have Ms. Caitlin Jordan and Mr. Imad Khalidi. On my right, we have Ms. Martha McCoslin. Uh, we will now move on to the opening statements for the candidates, in which they have three minutes. So we'll start with the incumbent, Ms. Jordan. Um, hello, my name is Caitlin Jordan. I've been on the council for three years. I've lived here in town for my entire life. I went away to college at New England College where I graduated first in my class with over a 4.0 GPA, receiving a BA in psychology. Immediately following um, my undergrad, I went on to law school and graduated from the University of New Hampshire School of Law. Um, came home and passed the bar here in Maine and have a very small practice here in Cape Elizabeth where I do not very much with my law degree because I spend most of my time running my family farm. My parents own Alwise Brook Farm and I spend every day working alongside my father on the farm. I also am the executive officer in the Cape Farm Alliance here in town as well as the vice president and treasurer of the Cape Business Alliance. So I find myself very busy and involved in the community. I feel that I represent a segment of the community that's not currently represented on the council and bring a unique and interesting perspective to many of the topics that come before us. Thank you. Mr. Khalidi. My name is Imad Khalidi. My accent could be a bit tough. I speak fast, so I'll slow down as much as I can. I was born in Jerusalem. I moved to France for 25 years and I came to the United States in 1990. I became an American citizen in 2000. I moved to Cape Elizabeth in 1995. I've got two children, two boys in Cape Elizabeth High School and Middle School. My son's name is Omar, most of you knows him. The other son is Aiden, he's in the seventh grade. My wife is from Iceland and she's also an, Amer an American citizen, so we are very international in our family. Uh, the reason I'm, giving, I'm, I'm running for a candidate for town council is that when I came over here I had nothing. Today America gave me and it's my duty and obligation to give back to America. So I have to start by the small town, and maybe one day I'll go to the state, who knows. But that's the only reason why I'm here and why I'm going to run for, the, for town council. For me, it's education to prepare you for the next generation, to prepare the next generation to fight the assets of this town is your school. Secondly, land preservation, I, I hate cutting trees. And I think farmers are the backbone of our, our life. 95% of our food is imported from other states. Even strawberry comes from Canada. And our farmers have to be conserved and helped. I think real estate taxes should not be risen on low senior citizens' income because those guys built up this town, prepared it for me, and then we are preparing it for you guys. And we have to, to thank them for what they are doing. To thank them, I don't think they can afford any more tax increases. I think the library is important, but I think the content is first, and then the building is second. Content is technology, and I think we cannot only rely on the town to give us money for the library. We should raise money from Amazon.com, from Nobel and Barn, from Google, from any, co any company outside this town who is ready to put money in, in the library. And for me, very important, from where I come, safety and security does not exist. I come to a land which security and safety is very important for me. Drugs and violence is not, has no place in our town. Ms. McCoslin. Good evening. Hi, my name is Martha McCoslin. Most people in town know me as Molly. Legally, my name is Martha. Um, thank you, Mr. Jordan, for hosting this evening. And thank you, AP Gov students, also for participating tonight. 
Um, I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes introducing myself to you. I've lived in Cape for almost 20 years. I grew up in Maine. My husband, Barney Hintlian, and I have two daughters educated in Cape schools. Some of you students might know them both. My older daughter, Julia Hintlian, graduated in 2012. My younger daughter, Olivia Hintlian, is a sophomore at CEHS. I have over 25 years of management and real estate experience in a variety of fields, including high tech, manufacturing, and healthcare. I've been working on a graduate degree as well for the last few years. I'm anticipating I will be graduating in 2014. Looking forward to putting that behind me. Um, I have volunteered on a number of school, sports, and community events. Um, I've been a trustee at Thomas Memorial Library, a member of the Library Foundation Board as well. Most recently, I've been chairing the council-appointed Library Planning Committee, a committee charged with planning for library facilities and services for the next 25 years. I am anticipating that we'll have a recommendation for the council in November. I'm optimistic it will be the right recommendation. We've worked hard. We've spent about six months together as a committee. We meet about every 10 days. We have been driven hard, and I, I do believe we will come back with the right solution. I'm running for council for a number of reasons. First, this, as we all know, is a terrific town to live in. We have great schools, committed teachers, and parents. We have beautiful natural resources and an awareness of what it takes to protect them. And we have a well-run town government. And that leads me to my second reason for running. I am supportive of the one town concept, and I have great respect for the work the school and the town employees do, as well as for the work that the members of the various boards and commissions in town do. As a counselor, I'd be committed to supporting the tradition of excellence we have in town and school government. Finally, I'm running because I have time and because I care. I look at the government shutdown we have in Washington right now, and I am reminded of the expression that war is the result of the failure of diplomacy. Similarly, the shutdown in Washington is the result of the failure to communicate and to work collaboratively. I fear that we live in a time of parties and staked out positions with little room to negotiate, and I know that leads to failure. As a counselor, I'll be committed to listening and to working towards solutions rather than positions. Thank you. All right, we'll now move on to the questions. The first question is about Fort Williams, and it is, in light of the several town votes to not charge fees for the use of Fort Williams, do you support continuing to charge fees for the use of Fort Williams? Would you increase the scope of fees? We go first to Mr. Khalidi. The, there are two types of fees. There is entrance fees to the, to the fort, and there is also the arts or whoever sells items in the, in the fort. I think in July, August, we have got so many visitors in town, and I think if we were visiting their towns, we would be paying the same amount that we would be asking them to pay. I think foreigners, not foreigners as, as foreigners, Canadians or, or internationally foreigners, outside Maine with plate numbers from anywhere else can afford paying $2 or $3 as an entrance fee to a nice monument that we have to preserve. This is what I think. I'm not saying put it all year round, I'm saying just July, August, when, when all the tourists come in, and the, the, because they leave uh, day litter over there, and we have to clean, clean up their littering from time to time, and I think we can ask them to pay $2, $3, whatever the amount is. It's a nominal mo money, but it helps to preserve the, the, the fort, and the fort is, is a jewel that needs to be preserved. Ms. McCoslin? Yes, I would say I do not support entrance fees in general. I do support certain usage fees, including probably group usage fees and possibly fees for carts and services. Thank you. Ms. Jordan? Um, I also do not support um, entrance fees or pay to park or any of those other fees that they've tried to come up with. I think the tour bus fees that we instituted this past summer went very well. The tour companies and the trolleys um, adjusted and adapted um, pretty well. We also have the cart, um, the vendor carts that have um, a bid that brings in essentially a fee for their usage. Um, I think we don't need to expand it anymore. The, the citizens have voted on that and made it pretty clear. I think what we have is, is very good. All right, uh, we'll move on to the second question, which is, 
Maine has consistently been ranked at or near the bottom by Forbes for welcoming businesses. Are you interested in attracting businesses to Cape Elizabeth? If so, how? And if not, why not? We'll go first to Ms. McCausland. Hmm. I think that we have a number of small businesses in Cape Elizabeth. I also think that we have a community that is comprised of um, folks who value open space, folks who value the fact that this is a wonderful place to raise families and a place where they can count on good schools. I think the, the challenge that we have in welcoming businesses is finding the right mix of businesses, finding the right way to tax those businesses. Um, I'm not opposed to bringing in new businesses as long as they are, I'll call it small business, and, and appropriately sized for the community and um, businesses that will contribute to the ongoing success of our community. Uh, Ms. Jordan? Well, Molly put it very nicely. Um, yes, I mean, I support, obviously I'm on the Cape Business Alliance. I support businesses here in town. I think as a whole, we should be trying to support the businesses that exist as is right now. I'm not opposed to new businesses coming in, but as Molly pointed out, the small businesses or the right mix of business, I don't think we need to bring in a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts. We have a wonderful business right in the center of town, the local buzz that can offer all of those things that we need. Um, basically, I think the town needs to try and become a little more business friendly and support the businesses that we have currently. Uh, Mr. Clady. I run a business which is a 500 employees business based in Portland, Maine, as well as in Germany and Sydney. The problem is two parts. First of all, bring businesses from out of state into the state of Maine is something very tough to do because the state taxes in Maine are 9%. So somebody who has got a business in, in New Hampshire or in Massachusetts will not move to Maine unless the taxes of Maine are cheaper than the taxes of, uh, of uh, New Hampshire. Second problem I've got is that if you start competing, uh, bringing businesses to Cape Elizabeth, you are stealing a business from Scarborough or stealing a business from Portland to bring to, to Cape Elizabeth. And one day or another, Portland will attack the same thing, will put, move businesses from Cape Elizabeth to Scarborough, Scarborough to, I've lived it, I've seen it. People wanted me to move from, from uh, Portland to, to, to Biddeford for, for my business, and it was a fight between towns more than anything else. I think we do need small businesses like another dentist in town, or another journalist doctor in town, another lawyer in town. We need a small buzz two. There is buzz one and there is buzz two. It's, there is a generation which we can go to buzz one and then generation we can go to buzz two. I really encourage the center of the time to nourish more with small, small businesses, but not stealing them from other towns, just from students or college students who comes back from education from abroad, build up their business in, in the town because that's what the town needs. It needs its own new generation to come back. This is the biggest problem we have. Students want to leave Maine, study somewhere else, and we need to, uh, to, to help them out to come back to the, to the town of Cape Elizabeth. All right, so now we'll go to the third question, which is about Thomas Memorial Library. So if you could please explain your position regarding the remodeling of Thomas Memorial Library. Ms. Jordan? Uh, my position is I'm very interested to see what the library committee is going to bring forward to the, the council in the next month. I think it's made very clear by the vote we had last year that we, the community does not want to spend a very large, exorbitant amount of money on rebuilding the library. I think we need to look at what the future is going to bring in libraries. Having a large space to hold books does not seem realistic to me. Having an area with technology and the interlibrary loan that we have is great. I would love to look at the possibilities of keeping the building because of its historical value and importance to the community and whether or not renovating is possible. But again, it's all going to come down to next month's um, committee paperwork that we get, their report and what they have found out in the last six months. Uh, Mr. Cleedy? I would rather come back a bit to the school and then go to the library. If we want, I'm very much for the content of the library and the building is later on. If we are going to cut down the school budget to, 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 to build a library, I don't agree. I looked at my taxes back in 2007 till 2013. In 2007, 73% of the income of the 
town of Cape Elizabeth went to schooling. In 2014, the budget shows 67.5. I might be wrong, but those are the figures which are in front of me. If we are going to cut the budget of school to build up a library, I'm saying no. If in the future we can raise money from the public, but not from, no, not from the budget of the town to build a library, why not? GFK library was not built by the Kennedy, uh, Kennedy's money, money. It was built up by raising money and donations. Vice versa, every, every town can raise its own money through either advertising or uh, fundraising. Uh, Shore, Shore Road was built, the, 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 the track on Shore Road was built by the town's residents, but not subsidized by the town's budget. This is something I agree on. Ms. McCausland. Thanks for asking that question. Um, I would like to mention something I thought was interesting that Ms. Mizel Hubs talked about, and that was, I think what she, how she worded it was this, the concept of a library needs to be renovated. I wrote that down because I thought that was particularly interesting and a good way to think about that particular question we're talking about right now. A community library is a unique institution. It is, by definition, neutral. It's nonpartisan. It offers inspiration. It offers access to information. It offers opportunities for sharing ideas and services and opportunities for lifelong learning. Whether it's a new or a newly renovated library, it can be a gathering place and a community making place. It's a place for rich and not rich. It's a place for young and not young. It's a place where everyone in the community can come together. Our biggest challenge as a committee is getting it right. It's getting it right sized, right priced, and with the right design. I do know we are all concerned about budgets and taxes. I'm kind of surprised we haven't heard the question yet. What is the most pressing issue in front of the town? It's always budgets and taxes. We understand that. And whatever is proposed, it must be fiscally responsible. And I promise it will be. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the fourth question is, would you favor any plan to create sidewalks on Mitchell Road similar to those on Shore Road? And we'll go first to Mr. Khalidi. Yes, exactly like Shore Road, raised by the, by the citizens of, of the town, but not from the budget of the town. Shore, Shore Road was built by, the, by donations from, the, from citizens. A small participation from the town would help. Yes, I agree. Um, Ms. McCausland. Yes, I would agree with Mr. Khalidi if that is indeed the case, that we would end up with a small contribution from the town and the residents in that part of town wanted to raise the money for it, I would support that as well. Ms. Jordan? I also would support um, sidewalks on Mitchell Road. I believe I said three years ago that the Shore Road was the most dangerous road in town. That's why we needed a pathway on that. Well, Mitchell Road is certainly now taken that claim since we have a pathway on Shore Road. So I would be very interested and you know, inclined to just about any proposal that would bring forth more safety on, on Mitchell Road. We'll go, now go to open response questions from the audience. Uh, these will have the same time limit of two minutes as the other questions. And the first one is, how do you plan to manage town council responsibilities with your other commitments? Ms. McCausland? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I have a couple of answers to that. My first one is the same advice that I give my older daughter who is one of the busiest people I've ever met in my life. And what I tell her is, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. One of the things that I have found in the last couple of weeks as I have been working hard both on the library planning committee, um, working to pull my master's thesis material together, working on campaigning, um, I'll also throw in during the week, I'm a single mom raising my daughter. My husband is out of town during the week. I'm busy. Um, having said that, one of the things that I have found is the busier I am, the more efficient I am. And I've really loved taking on the additional responsibilities. I'm not anticipating that um, life will get simpler, only more complicated for me and probably for everybody else in this room. I can tell you I would not have run for this position if I didn't think I could manage it. 
Mr. Khalidi? It's a matter of time management, nothing else. When there is a way, there is a will. When there is a will, there is a way, both ways. Uh, if you manage well your time, you can manage it uh, well. And I know it's a commitment. I know it's a, it's a service that you have to, to do for your town. It's like jury duty. When they call you for jury duty, you have to manage your time and jump on the jury duty job. So it's a matter of just pragmatic time management, nothing else. Ms. Jordan? Well, I've managed for the last three years. I think I could do it for three more. I, uh, I wear more hats than most people in my life. I have several different things to do, meetings to go to, committees to be on, and I don't believe I've missed many meetings in the last three years. I think I can continue that. I have a very big calendar, and if I write the whole year's schedule on the calendar, and if it's on my calendar, then I'm there. Uh, the next question from the audience is, there have been many complaints surrounding the gun club off by Sawyer Road. Do you think something should be done about this? And if so, why? Uh, we'll start with Ms. Jordan this time. <laughs> well, currently something is being done about the Rod and Gun Club. We have um, hired an attorney to work as a mediator between the neighborhoods and the Rod and Gun Club. But basically, it's a constitutional issue with the law that is that protects the Ron and Gun Club here in town. It's one of the oldest ones in the country. And so you can't just go in and do anything you want. You have to follow the law. And we, as a town council, are doing exactly that. Mr. Clady? I totally confirm what, what Mrs. Jordan, Mrs. Jordan is saying. The Constitution allows people to bear arms, and that's the Constitution. And the law is the law. You have to abide by the law. I don't think that the Constitution says you should shoot uh, blindly, left and right. You should restrain yourself and control yourself. But both parties, I think w w the town has done a great job by finding a mediator, I think, mm -hmm. to sit them down together because this is inter-neighborhood inter more than, than a town issue. First of all, it's, it's between neighbors and then it becomes a, an issue with the town. I think the town has done a great job by finding a mediator to mediate this issue and I think it will be behind us very soon. Mr. Kassel. Thank you. Yes, I will say I live off of Sawyer Road over near the gun club. I am very familiar with the issues there and I walk almost every day through Cross Hill. I am sensitive to the needs, wants, and concerns of both sides of that issue. I am certainly a proponent of Second Amendment rights and I also do understand the concerns that the folks in Cross Hill have. Um, Having said that, I do think the town has taken the appropriate step in hiring a mediator, and I agree with Mr. Khalidi. I think that we can continue working toward resolution of that issue, and I'm optimistic, actually, that we will find a way to work something out. Thank you. The next question from the audience is, how do you specifically plan to support organic agriculture in Cape Elizabeth? And we'll go the opposite way this time, Ms. Nicasa. Oh, must you ask me that question first? Um, I am a gardener. And I am certainly in favor of organic gardening. Um, I suspect that most of the people certainly sitting in this room probably would agree. I think most of the people in this room, with the exception of Ms. Jordan, probably know more about organic gardening than organic farming. And as with almost everything else in my life, I defer to the experts. I'll leave it to you to weigh in on that question. I, I said what I, I think farmland is in this country is, is, is something very important that we have to back up and support because they produce organic food and mostly everybody is trying to, to produce organic food. It's a shame to, to bring strawberries from Canada which is non-organic when we can have organic uh, strawberries in, in Cape Elizabeth and buy them cheaper. There is no transportation fees, there is no cost behind for having our own farms doing the best job. We have to support our farmers. I can, I can plant two salads and three tomatoes in my garden as organic, but it will not feed my family. I think we have to rely more on our farm, farmers and farmland to produce more and better. Ms. <laughs> this is a many-pronged answer to a, a, what may have been a simple question, but first, um, supporting farms here in town, the, the town already does a great job of you know, giving tax relief to farmland. We have several farms here in town, more than many communities around. We have the Farm Alliance that is organized and the town supportive of that. To the specific question of organic farms, I think 
one thing would be the, for the community to educate themselves in the difference between non-organic and organic. I mean, you have two large farms in town, Owl Wives and Jordans, that aren't certified organic, but both use sustainable agriculture, which can sometimes be just as important to know about as having that label of organic. But we also have Green Spark here in town that's certified organic. And so it becomes an educational component put back on the citizens. If you want the town to support organic farming, reality would be that you, the community, and the citizens need to support farming. We need you to come out to the farms and to support us so that we can continue to exist because without support from the community as a whole, all the support from this town council isn't going to mean anything. Thank you. The next question from the audience is a specific question about land use in Cape Elizabeth. And it is, what is your stance on the connection between the two Greenbelt trails in Shore Acres? Is this an invasion of privacy, infringement, upon, infringement on property rights, or a necessary step in the enhancement of the Greenbelt trails? Ms. Jordan? I believe they, I'm assuming they're referring to the Paper Street issue up in Shore Acres, would be my understanding. And that, again, is a legal issue that needs to be properly defined. Um, we just received the Greenbelt Trail um, draft report as from, you know, from the Conservation Commission. And my first question or comment to it on Monday night is going to be to ask the town attorney to get a legal opinion as to whether or not that paper street can legally be turned into a trail. Um, if you look at it from one point that the timeline has expanded and the town no longer has the right, then yes, I think it's an invasion of privacy. On the other hand, if the town still has the right to turn it into a paper street and we as a town think that that's the most important trail that we need to be focusing our energy on, then it's not taking away private property and invasion of privacy. It's the right of the town to do so, but again, we seem to be coming up with several legal quandaries here before the town that need to have specific opinions put before them. And so I'm very interested in finding out what Tom Leahy has to say about what the town's position is on being able to turn that, that trail, that paper street, into a trail and taking it from the homeowners. Mr. Khalidi? I have to apologize because I live in the middle of this crisis. And running for town council means that I have to reclude myself from answering the question if I may not answer the question. I live on, on the spot of the, of the issue, and I think everybody understands that if you are running for town council, you cannot bring your personal issues on the table. Right. So uh, may I reclude myself from answering? Thank you very much. Mr. Gazan? Yes, I'd say I am certainly pro-open space. I think the town has a history of supporting open space, and I think in most of the surveys that have been done in the past, that seems to be the number one interest of folks in, in supporting open space in town over just about anything else. I am pro-open space, and I don't see a conflict with also being pro-property rights. I did appreciate your answer. Caitlin Jordan, because I, I, I do see that there are a number of legal issues involved in this. Um, I'll be at the meeting on Monday night. I am interested in hearing what the Conservation Commission is presenting and what the questions that the Town Council will be asking, how that will play out. Um, again, as with the farming question, I will defer to the Town's attorneys for direction on an issue like that. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, we should have people running around with index cards, so if any audience members have questions, they should write them on index cards, and they can be brought up here. Um, let's see. So the next question, open response question from the audience is, would you support the town's divestment from fossil fuels? Why or why not? Uh, Mr. Khalidi? Uh, I, I traveled so much in Europe, and lately I was in Florida, and I was amazed. I've got a boat, boat uh, which I park in, in winter in, in Florida. And next to me, the guy had the wind electric boat. It, was, it wasn't great looking, but it was very efficient. He had no need for, for gas, he had no need for oil, he had no need for electricity. His boat was running, a big boat of 50 feet, running with, with, the, with, the, with the wind. I'm very much pro wind generated 
electricity, wind generated uh, power and energy, the more we, 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 less, we depend less on, on fossil oil, the better it is for you guys, not for us. My, my past is behind me, your future is in front of you. And I think the more we rely on natural energy rather than fuel, uh, fossil fuel, the better you will be. So just to clarify, you would support the divestment, uh, Mr. Khalidi? Uh, just to clarify, would you support the divestment? What do you mean by? Uh, divestment from fossil fuels by the town council. The of removing funds from. I, I don't agree. I think this is something important that we have to re, re, reinvest in, in the future, in your future, not ours. OK, thank you. Uh, Ms. Jordan? Yes, I would support, as the questions are in the divestment from fossil fuels, I think alternative energy is something that we should really be looking into. We've been looking into it as a town council for years. We have committees that have been doing research, but I think we definitely need to look at solar energy. We could be putting solar panels on the schools and, and running, you know, collecting energy that way as long as, and windmills. We have had a windmill here in town for my entire life, right, at Bothell's garage, and they managed to do quite well with just their one windmill. If we could get a few more of those around town, I think we could really start to see some changes. Hard not to support alternative energy. I too would like to have a windmill. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure I have the right location for it, but my husband and I have considered it, as well as solar panels on our house. Um, as far as uh, divesting from investment in fossil fuel companies, I think that's probably the wave of the future. And I agree with Mr. Khalidi, it's your future. I, I think you'll end up feeling that way as well. Um, before we move on to the lightning round, are there any more questions from the audience? All right, uh, so the first, the lightning round, just to clarify. Is there one question? Oh, one question there. Are you asking me in particular or, or all of us? I, um, in general, I would say yes. And I'm hesitating in answering that because I'm not familiar enough yet with the town's portfolio. And until I know what the alternatives are, I would want to know that we had a plan for moving forward. I would not be in favor of making an investment change overnight without having a plan for moving it forward on a predictable basis. I totally agree. Me as well. I mean, while we might want to look at alternative energy, the reality is fossil fuels are being used around the world continuously. So keeping our money in fossil fuels might be the best thing for right now. I wouldn't want to move them overnight without having a stable plan of where we're going to move them to. Are there any other questions from the audience? All right, so we'll move on to the lightning round now. Uh, the lightning round, just to clarify, is yes or no answers. So we have a series of questions prepared here. Uh, we'll just go from uh, left to right here, this way, uh, repeatedly. So the first one is, if elected, will you act to support the conservation of more open public land? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Right? Uh, do you think that the educational benefits of the iPad program at the middle school will outweigh the distractions that will likely accompany them? Yes. Yes. I'm going to say yes. Do you support an increase in the proportion of the town budget devoted to education? Yes. Double yes. Yes. Uh, would you advocate for expanding the Portland Metro bus service to the Cape Elizabeth area? I, I guess I didn't see that one coming. No, I guess, no. Yes. Yes, with a qualification <laughs> that it needs to be sustainable. Um. Should there be more regulations regarding, the Cape, regarding Cape residents renting their properties? No. Sorry. Well, should there be more regulations regarding Cape residents renting their properties? No. No. 
and w would you support consolidation with other towns? No. Internationally, yes. <laughs> sure. I mean, a small town in France who wants to, gym, to, to, go, to twin with us, I have no problem with that. I like what he said. I, I would say in general, no, but I, I'd, I'd go to France I mean, to make that you, happen. I'm sorry to add on. If you go to towns in Germany or France or Belgium, the entrance of the town shows you with whom they are jumli, which means twinning with yeah. somewhere else. And it's a very nice, and they visit each other every summer and they spend the money every summer. So I would like to have a French, Italian, German, uh, Canadian, neighbor in Mexican, where at the entrance of the town, we are twins of the town. I'm sorry to So we would all support the expansion of a sister city. Uh, international, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. We already have a sister city. We what's, what's our sister city? I don't know, I just got an email about it. I, I know we have one. Is it in Japan, maybe? I don't, I don't know, I bring up my email. Just imagine imagine our, our, our children over here goes one, one week to that town and spend one mm -hmm. week in Germany and visiting there and vice versa, that's how they do it. We do have one. Sure, I'm sorry. If no. All right. Um, well, with no further questions, we'll now move on to the closing statements. So, a reminder the candidates have three minutes for each of their closing statements. So, we will begin with Mr. Khalidi. I'm not a politician. I have never been a politician and will never be a politician. I'm a pragmatic businessman. I think business, I think money, I think education, I think. The future of my kids and the future, which means the future of every, 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 every uh, adult uh, over here as well as, uh, as uh, people in the schools, we have to prepare them to go to face the world. Uh, Google is based on how much did we educate our kids. Today Google uh, market uh, cap can buy a country in Africa in one day and sell a country in Africa in another day. The, the, the future of this country, if we want to be as strong as we are and stronger and fight the, the Chinese uh, uh, importation of goods and sell our phosphorus to the world, it's only by education, nothing else. NASA is, is education, uh, Google is education, uh, Apple is education, Dell is education, everything is education. I speak five languages fluently, that's the only thing that I've got. I've got high school plus, plus two years college and five languages. My job, I'm successful in my job because I speak five languages. Nothing else. I have no other asset than that. So that's what I think education is very important for us. Now I'm running for town council because I feel I should do something for, the, for, 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 for this town. If I win, I'll win. If I lose, I will continue on investing in this town. I've invested before. I'll continue on investing in the future. Uh, but again, I'm not a politician and I, one thing that I hope I will succeed to do, not to become one. <laughs> Um, first of all, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all tonight, and again, thank you, Mr. Jordan, for organizing this. Um, I will say I, I'm, I've enjoyed being here, and I've enjoyed learning a little bit more about the other candidates, and I think you'll be fortunate as citizens in the community to have three qualified candidates from whom to choose. Um, we have talked about a number of issues tonight. Um, I, too, like Mr. Khalidi, am an experienced business person. I'm not a politician. I, too, hope that I never become a politician. Uh, um, I'll vote for you. I do think that we will have challenges ahead of us. Um, the term of town council lasts for three years. The challenges that we've talked about tonight are not the same ones that we'll have next year or two years or three years from now. I will tell you, if I'm elected, I will work hard as I have worked hard at every project I've ever been involved in, whether it's in education, in my own life, my children's lives, or in the lives of the young people in this town. I will also promise to work collaboratively. I can't stress that enough. And I look at all of the young faces in this audience, and all I can think is it's your future. We're all talking about it's your future. Every politician in this country is talking about. If we don't find ways to talk to each other, your future will not be as bright. I promise to work collaboratively on challenges tomorrow, next week, next year, all the way through a term. I also promise to bring good judgment to each and every challenge that comes before the council and to consider the financial and tax implications of every decision that I make. And I'll appreciate your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Ms. Jordan? 
Well, to go with the theme of the closing remarks here, I'm not a politician. I've been on the council for three years and I'm still not a politician. But I am running because I think it's still my future that I can affect. Um, I have been on the council for three years and if I'm elected again, I will continue to listen, evaluate, and do my best to make the choices that I think will continue Cape Elizabeth on the path that it has been on for my entire life living here. I have traveled many places all over the world and I chose to come back here and make this my home. And this is what I would like to do is preserve Cape Elizabeth to the way it has been and that we all love so much. All right. Thank you to the candidates. That concludes candidates night. Thank you. Thank you.